record this session. So this meeting is now being recorded. And just so you know, it's very exciting that more than 110 people have registered for today's webinar. I have a favor to ask. Right now, if you see little boxes on your screen, it is all of our panelists and sponsors. You don't see any of the attendees, just so you know that. My favor is please be kind to me today because this is my very first webinar that I'm hosting. And although I've done hours and hours of studying and preparation and hopes that there will be no glitches, I make no promises, especially promises I can't keep. So if there's a glitch, please, please, please be patient with me. While getting my master's degree in social work, I learned big lessons such as go with the flow. I hope you can relate to that. So you should have received an agenda in your reminder emails. Everyone should have received a reminder email yesterday and this morning. The seminar is one and a half hours long and we will have a movement break mid session. When this meeting ends, a two question survey should appear on your computer screen or your phone or your device. Please take the time to respond to that as we use that information to make improvements for next time. And we like everybody else hope that next time we'll be in person. If you've, again, if you've been in Zoom meetings before, a webinar is different. We cannot see the attendees. We cannot see the 100 people that are out there. So um, your cameras are off and your microphones are off. We can't see you, we can't hear you, but you can interact with the panelists and other attendees through the chat box. So on my laptops, there's a little chat box down in the middle of the bottom section of my screen. If I click on that, I'll see a little box that says to all panelists. Next to that is a little drop down arrow and click on that arrow. So you see all panelists and attendees and click on that. So if you write something, everybody can see. We'd love for you to take a moment and try out that chat box. Let us know what town or state you are in right now. And we will definitely be keeping an eye on the chat box throughout this session. Now I would like to introduce Michelle Jacobs, our Chief Philanthropic Officer here at the Kane Center. She's going to tell you a little bit about what we do here at the Kane Center. Michelle. Hi there. I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. For those of you who are not familiar with the Kane Center or the Council on Aging of Martin County at the Kane Center, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. In fact, the lead agency in Martin County serving seniors right here in our own neighborhood. We deliver hot, fresh meals to seniors every day through the Meals on Wheels program. Since COVID, we have gone from delivering an average of 325 meals a day to more than 500, up to 570 meals every day. We have a state-of-the-art day club and memory enhancement program, providing socialization, classes, and support for hundreds of seniors who are at risk for isolation, suffer from memory loss or mobility loss. We provide care management and navigation to seniors and families in crisis. And we have a primary care medical office, the Day Medical Center, right here at the Kane Center with a board certified geriatrician on site. Under typical circumstances, our senior center provides exercise, brain fitness, clubs, concerts, classes, and much, much more. Right now, of course, we have limited services because of COVID. But last, last but not least, caregiver support and educational events like this one are very important to us serving our mission. We are a resource for all seniors and their families. We thank our generous donors and sponsors who allow us to provide all these vital services. If you or anyone you know needs help, call us. If you or anyone you know wants to support our services, call us. Our number is 772-223-7800. And we'll put that in the chat box for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. 
as a, as a nonprofit organization, we really couldn't survive without the support of sponsors and donors, and we consider our sponsors resources as well. Today we have three gold sponsors. We ran a slideshow that included information about all of today's sponsors and presenters. Right now, I'd like to introduce Nicole Segalowicz from Supernus Pharmaceuticals. Nicole. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole Segalowicz with Supernus Pharmaceuticals. I'm the regional account manager in the area. Um, I'm happy that we're able to support this uh, webinar today. At Supernus, we put uh, Parkinson's disease patients and their communities in the forefront, and we like to offer options, both treatment and support services in that regard. We have three Parkinson's disease medications, Apikin, which is a rescue or on-demand therapy for Parkinson's, Myoblock, which is indicated for the treatment of sialuria or excessive drooling, as well as cervical dystonia, um, which is common in Parkinson's disease, and then Zidago, which is an oral medication also for the treatment of Parkinson's. You can learn more about our products by visiting our website, supernus.com. But again, thank you for having me here today. Um, we're happy to participate and hopefully we can participate in person one day soon. Thank you so much, Nicole. This is Donna speaking again. Nicole, and thank you for coming in a couple of days early to social distance with me and help me with the webinar details. Now we have Jesus Azan from Medtronic who's going to say a few words. Jesus? Thank you, Donna. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in this program. Uh, my name is Jesus Azan. Myself and my partner, Kimberly Howe, are the local Medtronic representatives that support uh, patients uh, with Parkinson's. Um, we work with the neurologist and the neurosurgeons all the way down from University of Miami all the way up to Stewart. Uh, and those are the physicians that treat Parkinson's, essential tremor, dystonia, and epilepsy. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions at the end of the seminar. Uh, with for any recommendations uh, for any patients who have any questions regarding the therapy and deep brain stimulation. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Very important information. Next, Jeannie, whose last name is too complicated for me to pronounce, from Encompass Health Rehab Rehabilitation Hospital, wants to say hello. Jeannie? Yes, hello, my name's Jeannie. I'm a rehab liaison and I'm with Encompass Rehab Hospital. We're located in Stewart, Florida and we're a national leader in post-acute care. We have an expert team of professionals that provide advanced treatments targeting, targeting conditions like Parkinson's disease. And with our help, patients find a clear path to move forward, experiencing a higher quality of life. So our hospital is staffed with physicians, nurses, therapists, dietitians, and pharmacists. We even have a dialysis site, suite on site and offer specialty services like pain control, wound care management. And there's no three day qualifying stay required to enter into our rehab hospital. In fact, many patients come to us directly from their home or their assisted living facility. Um, and if you're suffering from an exacerbation of your Parkinson's or you had an event like a fall or a urinary tract infection that sets you back, um, Encompass is just a phone call away and a, a rehab liaison like myself would come and assess you and we can directly admit you to our hospital and rehab you back um, to home to a safe level of care. Our phone number is 772-324-3500. And it's also on the slides that you'll see later. But again, that's 772-324-3500. OK, thank you so much, Jeannie. Appreciate that. I know you're all very anxious to hear our keynote speaker. James E. Galvin, MD, MPH, is a professor of neurology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He is the founding director of the Comprehensive Program for Brain Health and Chief Cognitive Neurology for Palm Beach and Broward Counties, leading brain health and neurodegenerative disease clinical and research programs. Dr. Galvin has authored over 260, over 260 scientific publications, 25 book chapters, and three textbooks on healthy brain aging, cognitive health, memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, and related disorders. 
Dr. Galvin's research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, Florida Department of Health, and numerous private and family foundations. I recommend that if you're watching this, put your view in speaker view. And let's hand it, the microphone over to Dr. Galvin. All right, Donna, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Let's see if my screen share works. I'll tell you in a second. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today a little about Lewy body dementia. Um, uh, as, as Donna mentioned, I am with the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health at the University of Miami. I'm also the director and principal investigator for the Lewy body dementia research center of excellence, which is one of 25 centers uh, located throughout the United States. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the disease, uh, talk a little bit about our research and then tie it up talking about, you know, how we approach and treat uh, these problems. Um, uh, I don't work by myself. I, I collaborate with a, a large number of individuals who do actually do most of the work. Um, and so uh, just some of their names are listed here. And a lot of I'm gonna show you is supported by grants from NIH and other foundations. So. Um, Lewy body dementia is really, you can think about them as the most common disease that you may never have heard of. Um, these are the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the Lewy body dementias really are two disorders. They're grouped together. One is dementia with Lewy bodies, and the other is Parkinson's disease dementia. So Parkinson's disease dementia occurs after Parkinson's disease. So someone has established motor Parkinson's disease, and at least one year later, cognitive symptoms may begin. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is really any other pattern of presentation. Um, we know from statistics that about 75% of patients who have all, uh, Parkinson's disease, um, who live more than 10 years with the disease will develop a dementia. Uh, these diseases are more common in men than in women. It's about 1.6 men for every one woman uh, with, the, with these diseases which is very different than we see in Alzheimer's disease where it's a, a female predominant disorder. Um, the decline in Lewy body diseases tend to be faster than we see in Alzheimer's disease. And this affects about 1.4 million Americans. So again, it's a very common disease. Um, and because it's not really well known, it often leads to significant delay in diagnosis and treatment. And we'll talk about some of the consequences of that. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, now I'm, I don't, I never compare one disease to another because it's not fair to people who have a disease that I'm comparing them, but just to give you a sense of the numbers. Um, if you think about this, in the United States, there are about a million people who have multiple sclerosis. There are about 800,000 people who have a stroke, uh, about 700,000 people with any type of brain tumor, about 250,000 people with muscular dystrophy, 30,000 with Huntington's disease and 12,000 with ALS. So you have a disease like Lewy body disease, which affects 1.4 million people, but a lot of physicians and lay people don't know much about the disease. And you have these other diseases that are much less common, but are better known. So um, I think one of the challenges is how we could raise awareness of the disease so that people can get diagnosed and treat and how we can do research to find new treatments. Um, these are the criteria for Parkinson's disease. Um, and so Parkinson's disease starts as a motor disorder. Uh, and so you have to have bradykinesia, which is slow movement, plus another symptom. So some stiffness or rigidity, a rest tremor or postural instability. So imbalance when you're walking and standing. Um, and then there are a bunch of criteria that help us sort of support the presence of the disease. But there are also exclusion criteria. So these things tell us that it doesn't seem to be Parkinson's. And one of them is early dementia. So again, we talked about Parkinson's dementia, there has to be at least a year between the onset of motor symptoms and the onset of dementia. But typically it's more like five to seven years. So if you see someone who has both of these things at the same time, that's not Parkinson's disease. That's probably dementia with Lewy bodies. From a historical perspective, for a long time, the literature suggested that in fact, no one with Parkinson's disease had cognitive problems at all. Matter of fact, the first 
person who described Parkinson's disease, Dr. James Parkinson in 1817, said it in the essay on the shaking palsy, which was the book that he wrote about Parkinson's disease, um, said that the senses and intellect were unaffected. If you follow through the literature, it really wasn't until 1888 that uh, Dr. Charcot uh, first described some of the changes in cognition in Parkinson's disease. But even into the 1930s, this is a classic neurological textbook by someone named Lord Brain, um, who said that Parkinsonism is not associated with uh, cognitive problems. Now we know that that's not true. And in fact, um, Parkinson's dementia is a very, very real condition. Um, and it develops in the, in the context of established Parkinson's disease. So again, it's generally more than a year, typically more than two years, usually on the order of five to seven years after the onset of movement symptoms that people will start to see a cognitive decline. And it can be in any domain. It could be in attention and executive function in visual perception in memory and language, but it has to represent a decline from what they used to be able to do. So it is a true decline. So if someone was never good doing math problems, that's not a dementia. So if someone was good at doing that and then loses their ability, that would suggest an impairment. So we have criteria that help us make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease dementia. Similarly, we have criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies. So this is a dementing illness. So it starts off with the cognitive and behavioral features and many people will have some motor symptoms. Uh, so their dementia typically is more one of attention and executive and visual perception. Notice for both Parkinson's dementia and for dementia with Lewy bodies, I'm describing impairments in attention executive function and visual perception. What I haven't talked much about is memory because in fact, memory is relatively preserved in these disorders compared to what you might see in Alzheimer's disease, okay? In addition to the dementia, there are other features. So there's what we call fluctuating cognition. So these are spontaneous changes in alertness and attention. So people tend to stare, have blank looks, look sleepy during the day. Um, they can have recurrent visual hallucinations. Um, so they see things, typically little people or furry animals. Um, they can have something called REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is acting out one's dreams. And this symptom can occur decades before any other symptom. So maybe 10 to 20 years before any other symptom appears, this REM sleep disorder could appear. And almost everybody who has REM sleep disorder is gonna go on to develop either Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. And then they can have features of Parkinson's. So slowness is the most common symptom, but they could have other symptoms as well. We also now have some biomarkers and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in a little bit, but these are lab tests that help us be more sure that dementia with Lewy bodies or the underlying cause of the condition. So we can do things with PET scans, so nuclear medicine scans. Um, we can do things with sleep. Um, we could also look at MRI and some other tests. So I'm gonna show you some examples of these tests um, in the next couple of slides. Now, before we move on, I just wanna say that, you know, it's the most common disease you may never have heard of, but there are famous people who have had it. Um, and so one of the things when someone who's well known develops disease, it sort of raises awareness about the disease. And so you may be familiar with some of these people. So for example, Robin Williams has Lewy body dementia. Um, Estelle Getty from the Golden Girls had Lewy body dementia. Uh, Al Arbor, who was a famous hockey player and hockey coach of the New York Islanders during their dynasty years, uh, died of Lewy body dementia. Uh, Ted Turner is currently living with the disease. Uh, Jerry Sloan, a basketball coach from the Utah Jazz, recently passed away from Lewy body dementia. Uh, Bill Buckner, baseball fans would recognize Bill Buckner, um, the 1986 World Series between the Red Sox and the Mets. Mookie Wilson hit the little line drive up the first baseline that went through his legs. He died of Lewy body dementia. Uh, Casey Kasem, a famous radio personality. Um, and Dina Merrill, a famous actress, uh, died of Lewy body dementia. Um, uh, another person is Donald Featherstone. Now you may be saying, who is Donald Featherstone? But the clue is in the picture. Uh, Donald Featherstone was the inventor of the pink lawn flamingo. Uh, also died of Lewy body dementia. Um, but for me, my story really begins with an important person in my life. And this is my grandfather. So this is my grandfather. This is me. 
uh, when I was born. Uh, I was the first grandchild in the family. Um, my grandfather and I, we lived in the same house. It was a two family house in New Jersey. They lived upstairs, we lived downstairs. So I grew up very close to my grandfather. Um, here he is serving as my sponsor during my confirmation. Um, you could tell it's the 70s because we had three piece suits with vests on. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I grew up with this very, very important person in my life. When I was in high school, uh, he was driving me home from a swim meet um, and he was making a turn um, on Kennedy Boulevard in Hudson County, New Jersey, uh, which is a very busy street. Um, and made the world's slowest left-hand turn. And so we were broadsided by another car. Uh, and I was 16 at the time, so just learning how to drive. And I remember turning to him and asking him what happened. Uh, and he blamed the car. He said it was the car just didn't respond well. Um, and I didn't think much about it because I was in high school at the time. Um, uh, my grandfather was a greaser, so he worked uh, for Colgate Palmolive, climbing between the machines and making sure that they all worked well. Um, and one day he fell off the ladder uh, and broke his ribs. So he went, was brought to the emergency room. And when he went to the emergency room, my grandmother met him there and the emergency room physician turned to my grandmother and said, how long has your grandfather, has your husband had Parkinson's disease? And of course my grandmother said, what are you talking about? Uh, and my, the emergency room doctor pointed out the little tremor that was occurring in my grandfather's hand. Um, and then over the next 10 years or so, he got progressively worse in terms of his Parkinson's disease uh, and then developed dementia. Um, started hallucinating, uh, having staring spells, uh, becoming more forgetful to the point where he really didn't recognize people around him other than someone he knew that was familiar. Uh, and eventually he passed away with the disease. Um, when people with Lewy body dementia die, this is what their brain looks like under the, under the microscope. So this is a picture of a Lewy body. Um, uh, this was described back in the early 1900s by Dr. Lewy. Um, uh, it has a very characteristic feature. Uh, it has a dense core and a pale halo. Um, under modern techniques, we have antibodies, which make it much easier to see under the microscope. So we're much better at making the diagnosis pathologically now than we were, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, when I like to talk about the symptoms, I'd like to put them in bins because it makes it easier to sort of understand it. So there are four basic bins of symptoms that occur with these disorders. The first are the motor symptoms. So people present with slowness, with stiffness, they are, have poor balance and they may fall down. They may or may not have a tremor. Um, their gait, they tend to shuffle their feet as they walk um, and they can have myoclonus, which are irregular jerk-like movements. Um, these occur, can occur early through the late stages of the disease. In addition to the motor symptoms, we can have cognitive symptoms. So visual tracking, visual attention, visual perception, uh, trouble initiating or starting things, and anything that has to go with being timed or doing it fast tends to be impaired because we move, they move slower. Notice the first couple of symptoms all relate to the visual system. So often the first doctor to see these people are the eye doctors. So people will complain that their glasses don't seem to be working anymore. So they'll go to the eye doctor, the eye doctor will give them a new set of lenses, They'll go home and it's not working. And eventually the eye doctor will realize it's not the eyes, it's really the brain interpreting the information. Then there are the psychiatric and behavioral symptoms. And these can be very disturbing to the families. Um, uh, these include visual hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there, typically small people or furry animals, but they can have hallucinations and other modalities. So they can hear things, taste things, smell things, feel things but visual hallucinations are by far the most common. Uh, they can have delusions. These are false beliefs. Um, so people thinking things that aren't true and you can't convince them that it's not true. The most common delusion in Lewy body disease is something called the capgrass delusion, uh, which is basically someone's been replaced by an identical imposter. So you're not you, you look like someone, but you're not that person. And it's very hard to convince a person that that's not true. Um, depression and anxiety and apathy or loss of interest is very common in Lewy body diseases. Of course, they can have the REM sleep behavior disorder that's acting out one's dreams and the cognitive fluctuations. And then the fourth bin is what I call constitutional symptoms. So these are symptoms that are sort of outside the brain involving the rest of the body. Because in fact, Lewy bodies affect the whole body 
they, they are found anywhere where there is nervous system tissue. So not just the central nervous system, but the peripheral nervous system as well. So people can lose their sense of smell. They can develop constipation. They can have urinary incontinence. Uh, they can develop drooling. They can have a runny nose. They can be lightheaded. Uh, so when they change position, they feel faint. Uh, they can have abnormal sweating and they can have sexual dysfunction. And for men, which is the more common uh, sex that will have this disease, it's the combination of increased libido, so increased desire with decreased ability to perform. Um, and so that's a common feature of the disease. If we look at the pieces of the brain at autopsy, um, uh, this is a part of the midbrain or the brainstem, the back part of the brain. And this dark line right here is where all the dopamine neurons are. This is called the substantia nigra or dark substance. Uh, and it's normal in, in people with Alzheimer's disease and in healthy controls, but it's abnormal. The, you lose the pigment because the cells die in Lewy body diseases. This is another part of the brain called the hippocampus. This looks like a little seahorse, and this is the seat of your short-term memory. You can see in Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus is very shrunken, but in Lewy body dementia, it's very similar to the control. So there's much less atrophy. So the parts of the brain that are affected are very, very different between Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia. Even though both diseases affect the brain, they affect different areas of the brain at different times. Uh, and that's part of the reason that the diseases appear the way they do. So the pathology, the Lewy body, those that microscopic slide I showed you before, uh, they can begin either very low in the, in the nervous system, so in the enteric nervous system, so like in the walls of the gut, and then spread upwards. And that's what we see when we think people develop Parkinson's disease, or it can start in the brain and spread down. And that's what we think when people develop dementia with Lewy bodies. So they're the same disease pathologically. They both have Lewy bodies, but they clinically present very different. One starts as a mo movement disorder, that's Parkinson's disease, and then develops dementia. One develops as a dementia and then later develops movement symptoms. And it really depends on where the pathology first begins and how it spreads. And we're learning more and more about this as we go on. Um, we did a survey of uh, over a thousand people um, uh, talking to the caregivers of people with Lewy body dementia. So both dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease dementia. And what we found when we talked to them about 78% of the patients were diagnosed with something else. Now, sometimes they were diagnosed with something that was similar. So uh, about 50% of the time they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. So not really correct, but not really wrong, right? Because they were presented with a dementia. About a third of the time they were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease or another movement disorder. Again, not entirely correct, but not entirely wrong. Um, so, so that's not really the problem. The real problem are the other group of individuals. So first, about 25% of people are not diagnosed with anything. So you go see the physician, the physician says, I don't know what's wrong with you. And they send you to another physician. The other 25% are diagnosed with a geriatric psychiatry disorder. So geriatric schizophrenia or geriatric bipolar disease, which for all practical purposes doesn't actually happen. Uh, and the problem with giving a person a diagnosis like this is they're exposed to medicines that could be potentially harmful. Uh, so it can be really, really problematic. Um, two thirds of the patients saw at least three physicians before getting a diagnosis. And that time was up to a year and a half. So think about the stress and strain on the patient and the family. You go to doctors, they don't know what's going on or they're giving you wrong diagnosis. You're seeing multiple doctors, they're changing the diagnosis until eventually you can get to a neurologist which make the majority of diagnoses. And, and they tell you that it's Lewy body dementia. Again, an 18 month delay. Uh, that can cause a lot of stress and strain. Uh, when we asked the, the caregivers about their perceptions of the physicians, really, most of the time that the caregivers have difficulty finding a patient who is knowledgeable about how to diagnose the disease and how to treat the disease. So you had trouble finding physicians who were knowledgeable about the disease, but more than half of the time after the diagnosis, the patient had to go back to the primary care doctor. So they couldn't find a doctor who was knowledgeable about the disease. They couldn't find a doctor who knew how to treat the disease. But at the end, they're going back to the doctor who was either knowledgeable about the disease nor knows how to treat the disease. 
Uh, and, and that can, again, cause some real stress and strain for the family, as you can imagine. But it's really useful to make a diagnosis early. Um, the Lewy body dementias are more rapidly progressive. Uh, they cause more functional disability than we see in Alzheimer's disease. The cost of caring for a person with Lewy body dementia is roughly double that for caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Part in due to the combination of movement symptoms, behavioral symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and those constitutional symptoms that I mentioned before. Um, in studies of the quality of life, um, it's much lower in Lewy body diseases than it is in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in fact, one in four caregivers rate having Lewy body disease as being worse than death. Okay, um, So it really takes a significant impact on, on families. Um, but a correct diagnosis really affords the patient and the family to do advanced care planning, how you're going to make the best choices for management, how you're going to make the best choices for care. Putting off the diagnosis doesn't change any of those decisions. You're just kicking them down the road when it becomes more difficult to make those decisions um, with a lot of evidence and time. Um, so the idea is we want to make these diagnoses early because it really does offer a lot of benefits. Uh, we've done some other studies looking at some differences between adult, child, and spouse caregivers. And in fact, they experienced the disease very, very differently. So when we looked at the adult children, they were less likely to live with the patient. Um, they were actually much more, be, much more likely to be caring for their mothers, where the spouses were more likely to be caring for their husbands. So a different sort of dyadic relationship, right? So it was mostly adult daughters with, a, with their mothers or wives with their husbands. Um, and so it's a very, very different experience of disease in that case. Um, when the adult children were reporting, the patients they were caring for tended to be more impaired. Um, the adult children reported lower quality of life and more, a higher sense of burden, um, but they reported less grief. So the spousal caregiver was grieving more than the adult child caregiver was but the adult child caregiver had a lower quality of life and more burden. Um, and again, so very, very different experiences of the disease. Um, we did some other studies to try to understand how we, how we can understand the, the concept of well-being. So if you're gonna look at well-being in a caregiver um, and you're thinking about the concept of burden, right, which is very high in the, the adult children, um, we can moderate or mediate or change the effect of burden on well being by increasing self efficacy. That is, give them coping skills, teach them how to be better caregivers, right? Give them skills to solve problems and handle situations, right? And this alleviates burden and improves well being. When we look at people who are experiencing grief, and again, this is more commonly going to be the spouse caregiver increasing their social support, expanding their social network, giving them informational social support, uh, tangential, uh, instrumental social support. Uh, this can reduce their sense of grief and improve their well-being. So by understanding the differences between the different caregivers, we can also design interventions that can provide additional benefits for the caregivers and alleviate some, some of the burden of disease. So now I'd like to share some research with you. So these are some new findings, largely led by my lab, but also discussing findings from other labs as well, as to how we're trying to understand more about the disease and how we could diagnose it better and develop new treatments. One of the things we're very interested in is looking at the differences in how the diseases prevent. Uh, so if you look at Alzheimer's versus Lewy body diseases versus other causes of dementia, so vascular dementia or the frontal temporal degenerations or depression, how people present and the type of cognitive symptoms they have are very, very different. And these profiles help us make early diagnoses. It also helps us design tests that may be able to help us make the diagnosis even earlier. So for example, memory is much more impaired in Alzheimer's disease than it is in non-Alzheimer dementias. Executive function is much more impaired in non-Alzheimer dementias than it is in Alzheimer's disease. So by doing the same type of test, looking at the different patterns, we can make a diagnosis. And this is what neuropsychologists do. When, they, when the patient goes to see the neuropsychologist, they do lots and lots and lots of tests. 
The reason for that is the different patterns will help you make a determination of what the diagnosis is. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we study the different types of domains, we can really begin to understand how people are changing and when there are chances to intervene. So this is from a study that I did. Now it's about 10 years ago. Um, and so these were people we had followed for a long, long time and they came to autopsy, so they died. Um, when we first started following them, they were healthy control, so they had no symptoms. And then they later went on to develop symptoms. So this black dotted line represents when we diagnose them, okay? And there are four groups. There are healthy controls who stayed healthy controls. There are people who are healthy controls that developed Alzheimer's, that's that black dotted line. There are people who developed Lewy body dementia, that's this blue line. And there are people who had mixed disease, they had Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia, and that's this red line, okay? Um, and so when we look at the four groups, what we see is about two to three years before the diagnosis, there is a change in their performance, right? This represents what we call a preclinical period. That is a period where the pathology is building up in the brain, but they're not yet clinically demented, okay? So they still may score in the normal range, but their scores are changing. And every time you test them, you can see this slow decline, okay? And after diagnosis, it tends to accelerate, become faster. This is important, right? Because here is when they're, when they're diagnosed. Here is when they're being symptomatic. So that gives us a two to three year window where if we could have a prevention type of treatment, we might be able to stop the disease in its path, okay? So a lot of our research is trying to focus on identifying this preclinical or pre-symptomatic phase. Uh, we do this sometimes by using fancy neuropsychological tests. So this was a test called the noise pareidolia test. It was developed by a group in Japan and then we modified it. Um, and so basically it's a type of ink blot test. Uh, and so there are ink blots with faces and there are ink blots without faces. And so we asked people to ask to tell us is there a face or no? And if there is a face, where it is? And if they see anything else. Um, and so it does a really good job of discriminating people with Lewy body disease from Alzheimer's or healthy controls. And this is from the data from the Japanese group. What the test looks like is this. So a bunch of blots, and then I would ask the person, face or no face? So I give you a chance to look, and there's no face here. Right? So if you saw a face, come see me afterwards. But, but there's no face here. Um, and then we would show another panel and we would say face or no face. And I'll give you a chance to look at the blot picture. And you can see in this corner, there's a face. Right? And, and so we look at how well you can recognize whether there's a face or not and whether you see the face in the place where it actually is. And in our data, it does really well. So the fact is that the test very well, very clearly differentiate people who have Lewy body disease from people who don't. Um, only takes about five to seven minutes to do the test. So in a very short period of time, we have a test that very highly discriminates. We can also use other biomarkers. One of the things we're interested in is how well the eyes move. And so in most disorders that have some signs of Parkinsonism, your eye movements are slow. So we can actually measure this with some fancy devices. So this is one version of the device where these, this person's wearing goggles and they're following a little thing going back and forth across the screen. Um, so we can get computerized measurements of this or we can do it on a pencil and paper test which is something called this King Divic test. So we have people read the numbers. And so this is the demonstration card. They have to go to this end then come back to the, the beginning and keep going down. And then there's the test. So here, they're spaced fairly par, far apart, and there's lines that make it easy to follow. You can't use your finger. You can only use your eyes. Then we take away the lines, and then in the actual test, all the numbers are kind of grouped together. So this is quite hard. And so basically, you have to read the number 541804635. So you got to keep going back and forth across with your eyes, and we see how long it takes you. Um, and one of the things that we found is this test does a really good job of matching up with Parkinsonian signs.
right? Um, and so we can look at people who are healthy controls, who are just beginning to show some signs of Parkinsonism and make a prediction of whether they're likely to develop Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia based on their eye movements. We can also do this with their walking. So we have a fancy gate lab, it's a computerized mat. The mat has millions of sensors in it. You walk across it and we can collect a whole lot of data. One of the things we collect is how many steps people take in a standardized distance, right? So we call this the festination index. Don't worry about what it's called, but basically we're looking at how many steps per meter, right? Um, and so a healthy control uh, walks 1.3 to 1.5 steps per meter. Okay, so they take big steps, right? As a person becomes Parkinsonian with cognitive impairment, they start to take more steps in that same distance. And then if a person has Lewy body dementia, they take lots of steps, right? And so a cutoff is about 1.65. So below that, normal. Above that, abnormal. Okay, so we can see this in people who have dementia, but we can also look at this in people who are cognitively normal, but their gait is changing as a proxy marker for future cognitive impairment. Um, and this holds true. So if you look at people with gaits less than 1.65 versus greater than 1.65, all of their cognitive test scores are different, right? So if you taking more than 1.65 steps per meter, cognition is markedly worsened. We can also use fancy imaging tests. So this is an example of a test, um, the Alzheimer's uh, MRI, I showed you, remember I showed you the gross pathology, the section of the brain. This is the hippocampus on the MRI. It's much more shrunken than we see in Lewy body disease. We can also use nuclear medicine scans. This is called a DAT scan, looking at dopamine. Um, and so this is what it looks like under a healthy control. It looks like a comma, but in Lewy body diseases like Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies, it looks like a period. So there's a loss of that dopamine. Then this is a type of scan that's often done in Japan. It's rarely done in the United States. It's a heart scan. Um, and so this is the heart shadow in Alzheimer's and in healthy controls. And you can see the absence of the heart shadow in Lewy body disease. The reason it's not used in the United States very much is because it's also abnormal in people with diabetes. Uh, and diabetes is much more common in the United States than it is in Japan. So it's not as a sensitive test in the United States. We can also do some fancy electrophysiology markers. So this is an EEG, right? So this is a very dedicated person. This is 256 leads glued onto their head. So this gives us really full coverage of the brain. And what we found is that as you move from controls to people with Parkinson's and Parkinson's with dementia, there's a change in the electrical activity of the brain. So it becomes a lot slower. So there's an increase in slow wave activity. Uh, and this corresponds to a change in their test performance on pencil and paper test. So another marker of disease that we can use potentially to predict who's going to develop the disease. One of the last blood things I wanna talk about is a blood test. Um, and so there are several companies, and this is a company that we're working with in, in Taiwan um, that's developed a blood test. Um, and so looking at healthy controls versus people with Parkinson's disease, we can measure this protein called alpha-synuclein. This is the protein that's in Lewy bodies, the, the, the pathology in the brain. And it increases as Parkinson's get worse, and it increases with cognitive impairment. And if you look at Parkinson's markers with Alzheimer's markers, you can start to differentiate people. So here's some data from our group. Um, and so what you could see is uh, above this line is increasing Lewy body pathology. Above this line is increasing Alzheimer pathology. So we could start to break people into people who have pure Alzheimer's disease, pure Lewy body disease, mixed disease, or indeterminate. That is, they don't have any pattern. Uh, so they're either healthy controls or they may have some other cause like vascular disease. So we can use these biomarkers to help us make better diagnoses. Um, so when we did this all together, we put this together and try to develop some predictive models. So to create a tool to help clinicians make a diagnosis. So we took a whole bunch of features from all of the studies that we had done 
And we found that each of these features increased the risk of developing Lewy body disease. So we created a tool, it's called the Lewy body composite risk score. So this is a 10 item yes, no questionnaire, right? That can be filled out by the family or by the physician. And basically it's asking, does the patient have any of these features? And you add up the number of yeses. And if you have more than two yeses, statistically you have Lewy body disease. So if you look at healthy controls, they have less than one. Alzheimer's has less than two. Lewy body dementia has greater than three. And that's true even at the mild stages, the mild cognitive impairment stage. So very, very sensitive tool that could be done right at home before you go see the doctor, right? That could help them make the diagnosis. Uh, I'm not the only person doing these type of things. This is something called the Diamond Louie Toolkit from a group in England that's developed this extensive worksheet to help physicians make diagnoses. So lots of tools being developed. In the last few minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about treatment. Um, so almost all treatments for the Lewy body diseases are what we call off-label. That is, they're not indicated specifically for use in Lewy body diseases. So they can be used off-label, um, but the physician should explain to you that it's off-label um, and that it's not approved for that use, okay? So for the cognitive symptoms, so the memory, executive attention symptoms, we use medicines from Alzheimer's disease. So medicines like denepazil or the other cholinesterase inhibitors. And, and in some cases we use memantine or namenda. okay? Um, so these are not approved for dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, rivastigmine is approved for Parkinson's disease dementia in the United States. Denepazil is approved for DLB in Japan, but by and large off-label use. For the motor symptoms, we largely use the medicines for Parkinson's disease. So carbidopa, levodopa, uh, the old brand name was Cinemet. Um, we usually don't use the other medications because they increase the risk of hallucinations. So mostly stay with carbidopa, levodopa for the Lewy body dementias. For the fluctuations, we use medicines that are used for uh, attention deficit disorder or narcolepsy. Again, not indicated for fluctuations, but they can significantly reduce fluctuations, but they can increase anxiety. So if you have a person who has lots of anxiety and fluctuates, if you give them a stimulant, you increase the anxiety, often to the point where they can't tolerate the medication. For behavior, we use medicines from the psychiatry field. So the atypical antipsychotics can be used off-label to treat hallucinations in Lewy body dementias. <clears throat> Antipsychotics do have lots of side effects. So you always have to weigh the pros and the cons before starting any medication. But we do use them and they can be effective. Um, there's also a newer medicine called pimavanserin, uh, which is approved to treat psychosis in Parkinson's disease and has shown effect in other dementias as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the REM sleep disorder, we can use melatonin, which is over the counter, or clonazepam, uh, which is a cousin of Valium, uh, which is a prescription medicine. So these can reduce the REM sleep events. And for some of the autonomic features like the blood pressure drops, uh, we can use different types of specialized blood pressure medicines and steroids, and they can help. But they, they have limited treatment um, windows. So uh, you push the dose up too much, there's too many side effects. So it's got a relatively small therapeutic window to use. Um, so again, for cognition, we have medicines and there is evidence that they can help. Um, for the hallucinations, the antipsychotics um, can be helpful, uh, but they do have side effects and you always have to balance the side effects with the, the benefits. Um, for depression, we use the antidepressants. There's not a lot of strong evidence, but often we'll use these and uh, there can be some effect. For REM sleep behavior disorder, again, the medicines I used, again, there's not a lot of strong evidence. It's mostly uh, anecdotal, um, but in anecdotal experience, these can help. Um, for the daytime sleepiness, we can use the narcolepsy medicines. Again, for Parkinsonism, we use levodopa, carbidopa. Um, and for the autonomic function, things like glucortisone, which is a steroid. Um, again, 
There's not a lot of strong evidence, but anecdotally and from small case series, we have a good idea of how to mix and match medicines based on individual symptoms, but it really is on a patient by patient basis. You have to look at each patient as an individual. Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to design new trials. So I actually did a recent search uh, of clinical trials for Lewy body diseases. There's only 94 registered studies and only 16 of them are active at the moment. So there's really not a lot of medicine trials out there uh, for Lewy body disease. Only six drug studies are actively recruiting at the moment. Um, and this is a problem. If we don't have trials, we can't find out if medicines are going to help. So we need help from people like yourselves to participate in trials, but also we need help from industry to help us develop new targets. Um, a bunch of trials are ongoing. Many of them have failed, unfortunately. Um, there's a couple that are still ongoing. We're waiting to hear whether uh, they'll be successful or not. Um, I mentioned before the research centers of excellence. There are 25 of them now um, uh, across the United States. I am the PI for the one in the University of Miami. There are three in Florida, Miami, uh, Gainesville, and uh, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville. And the other ones are scattered throughout the country. So to summarize the Lewy body dementias, Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies are very, very similar disorders. Almost everything I said today is, counts for both of them. The only difference is what came first, the movement symptom or the cognitive symptom. Um, for the present time, the symptoms are, the treatments are largely symptomatic, right? So we can treat all of the symptoms, but we have to individualize the care because uh, lots of side effects, really limits um, how you can treat patients. But we and other groups are really spearheading novel research to improve clinical practice and diagnosis, improve the lives of our patients and their caregivers and develop new medications. I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, I think we're gonna have a question and answer uh, session at the end and I'm gonna stay on to answer questions. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Galvin, thank you so much. That was fabulous, fabulous information. Really appreciate your time. And I know I learned a lot and it was really interesting to see your grandfather and your childhood pictures. Thank you for sharing. As Dr. Galvin just mentioned, our Q&A session will be after our next two presenters, which um, will be very shortly because we end at 3.30 today. And I do know that there are a lot of questions in our chat box and we will be addressing them after the presentations. So please hang in there and we'll answer as many, many as we can. And just a note, another note for Dr. Galvin, I loved your article about anisognosia. That is when people lack the insight to see what is going on. Uh, we, we all need to learn more about that. So now moving on, in the past, when we've hosted the events in person, we have received feedback from our audience that it was very challenging for people, especially with Parkinson's, to sit for a length of time. So we incorporated a movement break by a trained professional. As soon as we hear a quick word from our silver sponsors, Chanda Mora is going to lead a fun five minute movement break. Now I'm going to ask Deb Thompson to unmute and put your video camera on so we can see you. There she's unmuted. And how about a word from you about Senior Helpers? Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Thompson. I'm with Senior Helpers of the Treasure Coast. Uh, we serve clients from Hope Sound to Felsmere. We have 125 caregivers on staff, uh, CNAs, HHAs, LPNs, and RNs. Uh, we supply all of their PPE and do COVID testing for all of our staff as well. We offer transportation, shopping, uh, meal preparation, uh, light laundry, light housekeeping, medication reminders. Uh, we can come out and do a free assessment or a life profile, uh, or we can do it over the phone if you're a bit concerned about having people coming into your home, um, more than your caregiver, obviously. And we can send documents over DocuSign. Uh, if whether it's to you or to a family member that's not near you that's going to be taking care of the billing. Our number is 772-463-1112. And everybody take care and be well. Thank you, Deb. And again, we'll, we will show that slideshow again at the end so you can grab numbers and other things from the slideshow if you didn't get them now. We'll be sure you have all the information you need. 
Deb, thank you so much. And thank you for being one of our corporate partners. Mike Torrey, can you say a few words about Sonovia? And there's Mike. Sure, Donna, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you in particular to the King Center and for you to make this happen. And I know it's a lot of work. It's a new, uh, new adventure for you. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Synovian Pharmaceuticals has a product uh, currently on the market called Kenmobi. It's a sublingual film um, that's used to treat short-term intermittent off episodes in patients with Parkinson's disease. If any of the patients want to find out more about Kenmobi, they can go to kenmobi.com, which is K-Y-N-M-O-B-I.com. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mike, you want to repeat that one more time? The how to spell that? Sure. Please. K-Y-N-M-O-B-I dot com. Kenmobi dot com. All right. And you might want to put it in the chat box too. That might be helpful right. if you can we'll see that. that. So we'll have that. Thank you, Mike. Okay. And now we will have, I'm going to ask Jill Ball from VIP America to unmute and show your camera, please. Hello, everyone. Jill Ball with VIP America. We are so honored to be a part of this. We would love to talk to you about home health care services. We provide certified nursing assistance and home health aides to clients with Lewy body dementias. It's an important service to us since our founder, Jim Collins, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. We just wanna thank you and you can reach us at 772-220-6005. And we're just wishing you a happy, healthy, great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. We appreciate it. We appreciate you being a corporate partner, partner as well. And then last but not least, we will have Chris Collins from Vitas Healthcare coming in. Hi, Chris. Hi, thanks, Donna. Hey, my name is Chris Collins with Vitas Healthcare. We're the nation's leading hospice provider for over 40 years. We provide services that address the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual needs of patients, as well as their loved ones when dealing with advanced disease. So please feel free to give us a call. Our national hotline is available 24 seven for information on maybe how VTAS can help support you and your family if and when you need it. The number is 800-938-4827. Of course, you can give me a call as well. And um, thank you all so much and take care. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate it. And how about the audience? Are you ready to move now? Ready? We're going to have Chanda Mora, the founder of NeuroFit Florida, get us moving for about five minutes. And Chanda, are you there? All right. There she is. Hello, everyone. I'm Chanda Mora, founder of NeuroFit Florida. We are doing virtual training uh, through classes as well as one-on-one -on -one training. And we also offer in-home or in your pool training as well. There's just a couple of rules. I need you to stay safe, safety first. So if you need to stay seated, stay seated. Uh, if you're gonna stand up and you need to hold on to a chair or table, then you can do that as well. Um, the second rule is just to have fun. So are you ready? Go ahead and stand up if you're gonna stand up or stay seated if you're gonna stay seated and I will start the music. Just shift your weight left to right. Start shifting your weight. Good. Side to side. Side to side. Good. Now we'll start punching. Punch, 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 punch. Extend those arms out nice and long. Good. Ready, set. Now punch side to side. Rotate that torso. You got it. Good. Get ready, get set. You're going to march in place. Let's go and march. March, march, march. Lift those knees. You can march if you're seated too. It's all good. Back to those punches and punch, 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 punch. Excellent. Reach those arms out nice and long good back to those side to side punches and punch rotate that torso turn left and right you got it and smile you're having fun you're moving back to 
those marches. Let's go and march, 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 march. Lift those knees up, 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 up. Good. Now we're going to step side to side. Step, step. You got it. Step and step. Step and step. Good. A few more. Just step. You go at your own pace. Good. If you're going faster than me, fine. If you're going slower, it's fine. Ready, set. Back to those punches. Let's go. And punch. Punch. Reach those arms out. Good. Make them some powerful punches. Beautiful. Back to those side to side punches. All right, we're gonna start to punch high. So we're gonna have good posture. Reach, reach, reach up high, punching high a little faster. And up, 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 you got it. Reaching high is beautiful posture. Good. You got it. Eight more. Good. Four, three, two, give me those high knee marches again. Finish strong. And smile. Lift those knees. Excellent. Now we're going to do some power move. So I would love it if you get down low, hands on your thighs, and you're going to get low and high. Low and high. Get down. Reach high, get down, and up, down, and up, low, and high, good, reach, and reach, reach, good, for two, now start shifting your weight, side to side, good, reach, shift your weight right, shift your weight left, good, reach, and up, good. How about four more? And four, and three, good. And two, and one. Open up your arms nice and big. You're gonna turn your body all the way to the right. Open big, good. Turn to the left, open big. Ready, turn. And open, turn, and open. How about four more good ones? In four, open big, that's awesome. Three, open big, two, and open. Last one, and open. Ready, set, bring your feet closer together. And you're gonna step, and bring those feet together. And step, feet come back together, good job. And step, and together, and step, together. How about one more, big giant step, and push away, good. Time to do it on the other side, ready, set. And step, bring those feet together, big step. Feet together, three more, and three. Together, very nice. And two. Together, last one, nice and big. Step. And together, nice job. You're gonna like this one. I just want you to dance. Good. And dance, dance. Why? Because it's fun. It makes us smile. Good. Ready, set, I want you to plant your feet nice and wide and just rotate side to side. Lift those arms up in the air and you are finished. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Wow. Chanda, can we do that every day? That has to be really, really good for us. Thank you so much, Chanda Mora, founder of NeuroFit Florida. And again, we'll be running the slides again at the end. So if you need to pick up information, feel free to capture the information again then. Thank you, thank you. Many of you already know our next guest speaker, 
licensed clinical social worker, Laura Kramer. Laura has been working behind the scenes as a co-host of this event. And I really appreciate that she hasn't complained much about my panic stricken texts at all hours of the day. I think I woke her up the other morning with something about Zoom webinar. Laura's topic today is care partnering. And once Laura is finished with her presentations, we're going to go to those questions and answers for Chanda, Laura, and Dr. Galvin. Laura, take it away. Thank you, Donna. And it is a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm seeing you instead of me. Um, can everybody see me? Uh, so my name is Laura Kramer, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker with Morse Life. And my job title is caregiver counselor. And what I learned early on with Parkinson's is that we use the terminology care partner rather than caregiver, because there's a lot of give and take. There's not a lot of just, if you're sick, I got to take care of you. There's a lot going on. It's a gradual decline. People change together, learn together. These seminars are very often attended by both people with the Parkinson's, Parkinson's or Lewy body disease, and the people who care for them, their care partners. So that's why we use that terminology. And I really love that concept. In um, I run several Parkinson's support groups. And one of the traditions we have is to go around the room and say how long a person has had Parkinson's. And it's very helpful and encouraging when someone who is just newly diagnosed hears from somebody who's had the disease for 10, 15, 20, even 25 years, and they walked in on their own power, and they're still playing golf, and they're doing great, that um, the things that they might be worried about and concerned about that might be coming in their future could really be changed and monitored and you can make a difference in your own life. And Chandra just gave us a great example of how that happens. And I've been to many, many of these seminars, webinars and lectures, and pretty much every doctor, every physical therapist, occupational therapist will get up there and say, if you exercise, exercise, exercise. Dr. Galvin talked about some of the medications that are available. Some of these doctors are saying, if, if you can't take the pill, please exercise. I, what, what you can do with your own body can be more efficient and more effective than anything I can give you in a bottle. So that is really the party line. And that's a really strong emphasis with anybody with any kind of movement disorder disease. But what I hear when we do the breakouts, the way we do our support groups, is we start out together and we have a fabulous speaker, such as Dr. Galvin, and then we do breakouts so that I work with those care partners and my other community sponsors, some of whom are also sponsoring today's event, work with and, and give a chance for the people with the Parkinson's or the Lewy body to talk amongst themselves and talk about what their feelings are and what their struggles are. What I hear almost universally from those care partners is I can't get him or her to exercise. How do I get them moving? I know it's the best thing for them. They even know it's the best thing for them, but I don't know how to get them moving. We had a great speaker once, Ed Gray, who is a physical therapist and runs a big therapy center in Palm Beach Gardens. And he introduced us to the concept of the coach. And I just love that concept. And after he spoke, our next meetings and, and several meetings after that, the care partners introduced themselves as coach rather than husband, wife, care partner, caregiver. But I love the concept of coach because even the greatest athletes in the world, I like to use the example of Michael Phelps, who if anybody beats him, I'm in trouble. I got to change my, my example. But Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympic swimmer in the world, but he has a coach. And is his coach a better swimmer than him? Absolutely not. What does his coach have that Michael does that Michael needs? His coach is outside the pool. His coach is watching him swim. His coach can see if he didn't lift his arm high enough or he didn't turn his head far enough or he didn't kick fast enough. He can't see that for himself. So he pays this guy a lot of money to stand outside the pool and tell him how to be the absolute best he can be. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about partnership. If you or I walked by the pool while Michael Phelps was practicing and said, hey, dude, you're not kicking far enough, he'd tell us to take a hike, right? But he pays this guy. 
because he's watching. Now, the same way that we'd be told to take a hike, if you, the care partner, and the person with the, the movement disorder have not made this agreement and have not decided, yes, you're my wife, but you're also my coach. You're my husband, you're also my coach. You're my child, but you're also my coach. You're gonna to be told to take a hike. You have to have that conversation. And that's where the partnering comes in. When I see you're shuffling your feet, when I see you're bending forward, when I see you're about to do something dangerous, when I notice you haven't taken your medications, when I notice you've skipped your exercise sessions, how can I coach you? Am I allowed to coach you? What would be the best way to approach you? Do you want me to ask you the question? Do you want me to demand? Do you want me to be silly? Sometimes I tell people get an easy button or something that makes a silly noise just to kind of break up the tension but to get the communication going. But that conversation needs to happen as early as possible because if you're a person who has this disease and doesn't want the help and doesn't want the coaching, you're just gonna be annoyed by your care partner when they try to help. And your care partner's gonna be frustrated and upset and sad that they can't help you as much as they want to. So I really, really encourage you to have that conversation because this is a long sprint. Like I said, we have people in my group who have had this disease for 20, 25 years and they're living great, happy lives, mostly if they can communicate and talk to one another. Another message I, I have for both you, the care partner and the person with the disease is taking care of yourselves. There's lecture after lecture. And I, I really thank you so much, Dr. Galvin, for talking about the care partners and doing research on the care partner's stress and the difference between the relationships because it is so, so important. Like I said, partnership, you're both in it. One of you might have tremors, but the other one is having other symptoms, their own grief, their own worries, their own anxiety. So that's incredible that that research was done, that we're paying attention to those care partners. And what the care partners need is some balance in their lives. They need stress relief. They need time to themselves. And early on in the disease, while you, the person with the Parkinson's or Lewy body, are feeling comfortable, are safe, can take care of yourselves, encourage them to go go take your classes, go have lunch with your friends, go play golf, go get a massage, go do what fe make, feels good for you because what we also know about this disease, it is progressive and there will be a time when there will be a need for that care partner to stay closer and to be watching closer and providing more physical and round the clock help, whether it's them or paying someone to do so. But what I hear from care partners is that they're not willing to do that. And I say, please take advantage of the good times so that you can do that for yourself. And it's a gift you give to your loved one. Loved ones, those of you with Parkinson's and, and Lewy body, give that gift to your care partner. They'll be better when they come back and they've rested and they've cleared their head and they've thought about something else other than how are we going to beat this thing? How are we going to fight this thing? One other thing I just wanted to mention is the difference between empowering and enabling. Because like I talked about that the care partners want to jump in and start doing everything for their loved ones at the point where maybe that's not necessary. You've got to think about that. What can the care partners do to make things maybe adapted so that it's easier and safer for a person who's having movement disorder to do, but not just take it away from them and stop them from doing it? Some things might need to stop, and that's where discussions with doctors and therapists, whether driving is still safe, whether your cognitive uh, abilities, have you being able to manage the finances of the house, those things might gradually need to move over. But there's other things that you might still be able to do safely and enjoy doing that is good for you to keep doing as long as you are adapting it and making it safe. The other option is if a care partner comes in and says, nope, no more of that, you can't cook anymore, you can't do the gardening anymore, then you're enabling that person to be less able. You are making them helpless, probably sadder, probably grieving more, and it's a bigger loss than what the disease is already doing. So again, when you're having that partnership, that conversation, discuss these things. You know, climbing on ladders, probably out of the question. Maybe using heavy machinery, but what can you still do? 
how can you still be successful and powerful and moving forward? I have mentioned um, that I do support groups right now with all the changes in the world, we're doing things virtually. So I have combined, we had one in Martin County and in St. Lucie County, we've combined so that once a month we do have a webinar, a, a virtual support group. And I would be more than happy to add any of you to that list. I just send out a notice and an invitation about a week before. We do have various speakers and sometimes we just have a chat session so people can just talk amongst themselves and share their information and support one another. So I'm going to give you my information real quick. Maybe. So if you email me and I'll put it in the chat box as well, that is my email address and I'll be glad to add you to the list. And I always add, uh, like to finish on a funny note. So we talked about how hard it is to get people going and getting to do their um, exercise. So I found a couple little fun moments. My doctor told me to start my exercise program very gradually. So today I drove past the store that sells sweatpants. The doctor saying to the patient, the handle on your recliner does not qualify as an exercise machine. So Hope I gave you a little giggle and some thoughts, some good thoughts. And thank you so much for joining us. I hope you got a lot out of it. And I will be here for the question and answer. And I've been listening to you, watching you in the chats. So I will be passing along your questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm watching the clock because we end at 3.30 and we do have some Q&A questions and answers, but I do have to mention three more sponsors, just so you know about them. Our three table sponsors, Life Care Therapy Services. Matt Green is usually here with us um, since we're virtual. He's not here this year. He may be watching though. Elite Home Health Services is Suzanne Moore, who is usually here with us. They all have slides. And also Accorda Therapeutics, Mike Sorg. So many, many thanks to all the sponsors for their ongoing support. And Dr. Galvin Chanda and Laura are available for our Q&A question and answer session now. So Laura, did you have any pressing questions? You, If everybody, all the speakers, Chanda and Dr. Galvin, can turn your videos on now. And if you want to put your view in gallery view, you will see all four people. And Laura, did you have, I know, I think we actually emailed a couple of questions out ahead of time. I don't know if anybody wanted to address the ones I sent out. If you do, speak up now. I was hoping Dr. Galvin would. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see. So I, one of the questions was about, uh, arthritis and Parkinson's that limited exercise. Um, and, and so for, you know, exercise is important, but obviously some people have physical limitations, um, but there are low impact exercises, right? So, uh, you know, there's chair yoga, for example, which is very low impact. And so even people who have minimal physical fitness can get a fairly vigorous workout uh, through chair yoga. Um, there are also ad adaptations of silver sneaker programs um, that are, are chair-based, uh, again, where you can get a pretty strenuous workout from a chair. Um, so uh, movement is good, and I realize that there are things that impede movement, but you, know, you just try to find um, people who are trained in doing low-impact type of exercises so that you, know, you can make the most of your mobility uh, and hopefully eventually uh, gain additional mobility so that you can participate in other exercises. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, was there anything Chandra, else? I Chandra's tried to speak. You have to unmute. I would like to add to that. Um, I do have experience working with people who also have arthritis and Parkinson's. And if you have access to a pool, I have to say that the pool exercises are by far my favorite, whether you have Parkinson's, Parkinson's and arthritis, water movement, movement in the water is just so invigorating as well as easy on your joints and your bones. It is fabulous. So if you have access to a pool, that is ideal. 
if you don't have access to a pool, like doctor said, uh, just stretching, um, chair tai chi, uh, there's, but stretching in general, easy flow movements, so yes. Right, thank you. And I know there was a question in the chat box about, was it medications for hallucinations that don't affect the heart? Was it? Was yeah, that so there were several that? questions about hallucinations. And so I will preface any question is that I cannot give an answer specific to you because I don't know the person who's asking the question and I haven't examined the patient. So medication type answers are broad in general in nature. Um, so there are no medications that are specifically approved to treat hallucinations in Lewy body dementia. Um, we do use medicines off label, as I mentioned during the talk. Um, so these are medicines that are largely from the psychiatry world, um, and they can be effective in reducing hallucinations. Uh, but the first thing to think about is does the symptom need a medicine at all, right? So not every symptom needs a medication. Um, so if you can talk the person out of the hallucination, there's no reason to give them medication. Um, and so generally I ask uh, the care partner three questions. So does the hallucination or any other behavior uh, for that matter, does it interfere with patient care? Does it interfere with patient safety or does it interfere with the care partner's safety? And if you can't answer yes to one of those questions, a medication is not needed. Uh, to treat a behavior. You can use non-pharmacological approaches like distract and redirect. Um, but if medications are needed, then they are all off-label. They all have significant side effects. Uh, and so you would need to discuss with your prescribing physician, you know, what are some of the options that could be available to you based on um, all the other concomitant or comorbid medical conditions. Because uh, again, all antipsychotic medications have black box warnings. They have significant side effects. Even if they rarely occur, they can occur. So it's important to discuss that with your neurologist or, or internal medicine doctors. All right. Thank you so much. And I know there was a question in the chat box about the vaccines here at the Kane Center, which we have day medical in our building. And so far we've only received and, and dispensed 100 doses. So we don't know what's in store for the future. If you go to canecenter.org, you can click on the day medical part of that of the website and, and you can get updates via the website. Thank you. Laura, was there anything else? There was the, a oh good yeah. Go ahead. There was a question uh, again for Dr. Galvin, kind of a distinction between vascular dementia, vascular Parkinson's, and Lewy body. Right. So vascular dementia is a dementia that's due to microvascular disease, so disease of the blood vessels, um, usually caused by either one large stroke or multiple small strokes. Um, most people with vascular dementia also have some Alzheimer's disease changes. Um, vascular Parkinsonism, you know, when I was training was thought to be incredibly rare. We now know it's not. Um, so if, if vascular lesions are in certain parts of the brain, it can mimic some features of Parkinson's, um, although it's, it's different. It's clearly different when you're examining them, but can mimic some features. Um, the only relationship directly to Lewy body dementia is the Parkinsonism that you can see. Uh, vascular dementia typically does not have hallucinations, fluctuations, or REM sleep disorder. Those are not features of, of vascular uh, disease. Um, so, so the only relationship is the Parkinsonism. Uh, the Parkinsonism in Lewy body dementia looks like Parkinson's disease. The Parkinsonism in vascular dementia often has a slightly atypical uh, presentation to it. Um, so, but they are, they're due to un different underlying pathologies. Thank you. Go ahead, I, I Laura. I think some of the other ones you answered, I had a question. You mentioned something that I hear very frequently when I, when I'm working with a, a care partner, uh, taking care of someone with Lewy body, you, you gave the name to the delusion that there's more than one of the person. I didn't realize how, how common it was, but I have three in a row who are dealing with that. Cap, how do you spell that? Capras? What is Capras. that? Capras. C-A-P-G-R-A-S. 
So it's a misidentification delusion. So you look at someone and you think that that's the person that's been uh, replaced by an identical imposter. So sort of like invasion of the body snatchers. Um, and so typically what happens, usually it's directed at the care partner or they can be directed at other people, but typically at the care partner. And so, um, you know, the care partner will be in the room and they'll be asking for the care partner and you can't convince the person that the care partner is in there. Um, so strategies could be, for example, you know, for the care partner to leave the room and then talk to the person from outside the room and then keep talking as they come into the room, which sometimes can can break the delusion, um, or um, you know, tell the care tell the patient that the care partner is wearing a red blouse or a a flower or a scarf, and then as long as you have that scarf, you can sort of hopefully redirect them to the scarf, which will make them think, oh yes, you are Mary, not imposter Mary. Um, but that doesn't always work. It, it's a it's a really challenging symptom, but it's very common in Lewy body disease. Whereas paranoia um, is more common in Alzheimer's disease. Paranoia is less common in Lewy body disease. Yeah, thank you for those tips. I do, I, like I said, I have several who are dealing with that. They do walk out of the room, come back. Sometimes they have them call the phone and their phone rings right on them. Um, but I like the idea, I'll talk about, I'll talk to them about the body, that, that having something on their body that identifies them. Or some of them say, oh yeah, the other one of me is just on a trip right now, but I'm me. And it's interesting because they use the same name. Um, but I never knew it had a name. So I learned something fabulous today that I could pass along. Good. Um, and we're, we're about running out of time, Laura, right. with more questions. And I know there so, was a quick vaccine question for Parkinson's, but we need to wrap up. Okay. And let me, let me, can I do one more? Well, one more. Because I think you answered one of the other ones, doctor. But if there, somebody's acting out their dreams for is the very first symptom, is that likely to be Lewy body or could it be Parkinson's? So statistically, um, REM sleep behavior disorder or acting out dreams um, will lead to a Lewy body disease, most commonly Parkinson's disease, second most commonly dementia with Lewy bodies, and then much less commonly something called multiple systems atrophy, which is a very, very rare disorder. Um, so there are a few people who die who have REM sleep disorder that never develop any other symptoms, but for the most part, uh, people go on to develop either Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, or in very rare instances, multiple systems atrophy. Statistically speaking, it's not a guarantee. It's, it's, it's a feature uh, of the disease. Thank you. I know there could be a lot more questions. Um, we're running out of time and I, you know, I promised our guest speakers we would stop and end on time. Um, one of the things I just want to ask if any of our speakers have any closing comments i'd like to start with dr galvin if you have some closing remarks for our audience well i think the most important thing is that people read uh, and become informed about these topics speak to your physician but sometimes you're the patient's best advocate um, and so seek out sources of information so the Kane center would be one source of information but um the Lewy Body Dementia Association, the Alzheimer's Association, the Lewy Body Dementia Resource Center. Um, there are a whole host of places where you can get information and having that information can be your best friend because knowledge is power. That's awesome, thank you. Chanda, Mora, do you have any closing comments? Chanda asks you. Oh, and there we go. Uh, You're okay. I just want everybody to remember that exercise is medicine. And Laura, thank you for stressing that earlier too. Exercise truly is medicine. So everyone exercise, move. I like that. Laura, how about you? Do you have some a closing comment? Always just know that you're not alone. Join a support group. Um, in addition to some of the sites that Dr. Galvin talked about, the Parkinson's Foundation and the APDA have wonderful resources on their websites and all kinds of virtual classes, exercise and mind games and, and wonderful, wonderful things. You are not alone. Even though we can't be together physically, there's so much out there. Please reach out and get help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our fabulous speakers today. We really appreciate your time. I know I learned a lot from everybody. Thank you to our fabulous sponsors. And I'm going to run that slideshow again, even though we'll basically let our 
presenters leave the meeting so they can tend to their other things. But once again, thank you. We wish you a very healthy, happy new year and over and out. And I'll be sharing that slideshow now. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.